Radical Book Club, What Writies Can Do. The first time I raised the idea of righties learning from lefties, a lot of people greeted it with derision. Plenty still do. That's a terrible attitude, one that righties need to overcome if we want to win. Some righties argue that we don't need to learn from lefties because righties are just better. You've heard it, I'm sure. Lefties are weak. Lefties are cowardly. Lefties are afraid of work. But absolutely none of that is true. Lefties are tough. Lefties are brave. Lefties are smart. And lefties are the hardest workers you'll ever see. Part of the issue here is cultural. Some of the ways lefties get and use power are very culturally offensive to righties. It's hard to intellectually appreciate a difference in values when every fiber of your being is telling you that the other person is just being an asshole. And it's hard to see the mechanics work because the press talks about lefty movements and movements generally as if they just magically happen. But other parts of this attitude go back to high school civics class. Political movements are part of civics too, but school books don't talk about how they actually work. In high school civics, we talk about bills, and we talk about laws, and we talk about the three branches of government, but we don't ever talk about power. We talk about Rosa Parks, but not about the Highlander Folk School. We talk about Martin Luther King, but not Ella Baker, which means that we don't address huge parts of how the world actually gets changed. The legendary biographer Robert Caro mentioned once that he had heard college professors talk very convincingly about how the paths for freeways in New York City were chosen. The professors listed variables and considerations and trade-offs that they talked very knowledgeably, and nothing they said was worth a damn, because the paths for the freeways in New York City were chosen for one reason and one reason only. A freeway was where it was because Robert Moses wanted to build a freeway there. Considerations meant nothing next to power. That's what movements are about, gaining power. Movements don't just happen, and they're not the product of orders from on high, or rent of protesters paid out of somebody's checkbook. They're the product of a lot of people doing a lot of hard work over a very long time. Righties don't want to believe that. Thus, the same old horseshit is said. Oh, it's all George Soros. Oh, we don't get turnout for protests because we all have jobs. Oh, we win a second civil war in five minutes anyway because the lefties are wusses and we've got all the guns. It can't possibly be that there's work we need to do, work that we've been neglecting because we don't understand how it works and we're lazy. That's unthinkable. Well, think it, because it's true. Some righties talk about the idea of a post-political world, the idea that a system with less citizen input on the continuum from Singapore to monarchy or neo cameralism would be more stable. But in a world without elections, there would still be shifts in power. It's just that the mechanics by which power shifts wouldn't have occasional moments of relative transparency. And those circumstances, I hate to tell you, favor the left. Look at how often the right wins elections, but doesn't get what it wants while the left doesn't win as many elections and gets what it wants anyway. Leftist organizers are some of the most important political figures in the country. I didn't vote for them, did you? I don't know about you, but I like getting what I want, and I like the idea of having as much power to get it as many ways as possible. I like the idea of having power to keep my politicians honest, power to exercise directly in my world, and power that can be used directly to make my country, the world, and people's lives better. And let me be frank about where I'm coming from politically. I'm not coming at this from a hard righty perspective here. I'm not even a fringe type, not a reactionary or an ANCAP or anything. I'm a normie, and this is me screaming at normies that we have to get up off our asses. Listen up, normies. If we don't organize for power, other people will. The good news is, there are a lot of us. So let's organize for power. Here are some brief thoughts about how to get it. Briefly put, the organized left has power because it has a lot of organized groups that 1. Employ different approaches 2. Communicate, negotiate, and cooperate 3. Serve their side goals 4. Show value 
and five, provide service to their community. The right, on the other hand, has groups focused on electoral power and getting out the vote, mainly. This divergence has led us to the position we're in. The lefties are better at winning the culture. The righties are better at winning elections. And neither political party is what you'd call responsive to its base. The bases on the left and right have had different approaches to the situation. On the left, the base is focused less on pure electoral power than on capturing institutions and pressuring for power directly. This has actually worked out quite well for them and provides a foundation from which to press for electoral power. On the right, the base is focused on evangelism, saying repeatedly and without means for enforcement what it believes people should do. This approach has worked out much less well. Righty action is mostly devoted to electioneering, meaning that a righty base that wants change gets no practice in the mechanisms of obtaining it unless they serve on campaigns, which are, by definition, mostly run by the establishment types. This suits the righty establishment just fine. The only area where grassroots righties have had actual measurable success in the last couple of decades is gun rights. And there's a reason for that. Literally everything about guns mandates local activism and involvement. State and local firearm laws vary, so you have to know what's lawful where you live. And unless you have a lot of acreage and are willing to put the necessary work into building your own range, you need to go someplace to do your shooting, which means a gun club or range, which means you'll be encountering, on a regular basis, people like you who share your self-interest when it comes to your ownership of firearms. You can't buy guns on Amazon.com, meaning that you have to go to a gun store or a gun show, which offers you another chance to meet people. And at a gun show, somebody's probably tabling for something political, or selling books you won't find at your local Barnes & Noble, or you know the drill. Guns are on-ramps to activism. That's why gun nuts do so well. And righties need more on-ramps. The dichotomy between lefty and righty approaches persists on college campuses. Lefty students are trained to build capacity and power. Righty students are trained to listen to speakers, evangelism, or run campus newspapers, evangelism. So we're pretty good at talking, but not actually accomplishing anything. So let's be something more than evangelists. Calling for personal transformation is inefficient without mechanisms that can back it up with pressure. Mechanisms aren't as fun as just telling people what to do. I know. Everyone wants to be Malcolm X. No one wants to be third brother from the left X who stuffs envelopes in the mosque's basement for 10 hours. But we need third brother from the left X. And we need somebody to tell him what to do and someone to buy the envelopes and someone to run the mailing lists. That's the stuff I'm going to focus on here. Making a place for third brother from the left X and how we do it. I'm not claiming to be the leader of anything here. I'm certainly not an expert. I'm just the guy who's saying, this is the workshop, the tools are over here. Even if I were an expert, I wouldn't do much good. We don't need an organizer. We need tons of organizers and lots of organizations. So that's step one, creating lots of organizations. I don't mean social clubs either. Righties love to make social clubs. We get together, hear a speaker, bitch about liberals, punch and pie. Well, screw punch and pie. We need to create effective organizations that have their focus on actually doing stuff. The first thing I'm going to recommend is a decentralized approach that I've been talking about occasionally for a while. It's called Five Righties, based on the affinity group structure. Basically, Put yourself together with a group of ideally, but not necessarily, four or five righties, you know well, who share your politics. Give your group a goofy name. Boom, five righties. We're not doing anything fancy here. These are just principles, cheerfully ripped off in part from food, not bombs. One, five righties is about people, not money. About making positive rightward change, not making a buck. Two, Five Righties has no formal leader or headquarters. It's a tactic, not a movement. Every group is autonomous and makes its own decisions. Five Righties is dedicated to nonviolent direct action and works for nonviolent social change. It is not a home for garbage people. If that doesn't work for you, 
go somewhere else. Again, it's okay if you're not actually five righties. Maybe you start off with two or three or four people. Getting together is the most important thing. Once you've got your group together, go do stuff, simple stuff to start. Leaflets and flyers promoting a simple, broadly appearing righty message. I'm tired of going to coffee shops and bakeries and looking at bulletin boards and seeing a bunch of flyers about lefty things and no righty ones. If you want to do more for visibility, pull some fun, silly stunts that don't do any harm but draw attention to your message. Do research on your own town. Since there are a bunch of you, divide up the work. Remember when you were a kid and wrote out your whole address? The universe, the solar system, Earth, America, state, and like that? Do that, but for the politicians who rule you, and their donors, and their allies, and their enemies. Learn who the movers and shakers are in your town. Same thing with your local press. Who are the owners? Who are the publishers? Who are the editors? Who are the reporters? What are their interests, their beats, their vulnerabilities? Get contact information for all of them. The most basic pressure tactic is just being a force multiplier. When you can call your politicians, there's five of you. So now instead of one call you're making, it's five. As you get more practice and make more friends, you can build up lots of people to call your politicians. Learn what other groups exist in your town. Churches, clubs, business associations, that kind of thing. Go make friends. Get their friends doing stuff too making their own groups. That's how lefties get numbers. They don't have one group that tries to turn people out. They get a whole bunch of groups turning out people. The more groups you get, and the more people those groups have, the more visible your numbers are when it comes time for protests and actions. Do capacity building. Don't just count on my recaps. Give the lefty authors some sales and read everything covered in the Radical Book Club columns on both the decentralized and centralized left. Some suggestions could include Jonathan Smucker's Hedge Enemy How To, L.A. Kaufman's Direct Action, Becky Bond and Zach Exley's Rules for Revolutionaries, Andrew Boyd and Dave Oswald Mitchell's Beautiful Trouble, Saul Alinsky's Rules for Radicals, James McLeavy's No Shortcuts Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age, Eric Mann's Playbook for Progressives, 16 Qualities of the Successful Organizer, and Lee Staples' Roots to Power. And don't stop there. Read other books, too. How-to manuals, activist memoirs. If you're interested in interesting stunts the way the lefties do them, one book worth your attention is Recipes for Disaster, an anarchist cookbook, by the Crime Think Collective. Your lefty friend may have an old copy from their radical phase, or you can find it on Amazon.com. Remember that laughably fake Antiphon manual that went around righty social media? Well, this is the real thing, or one of them anyway. Lots of interesting stuff, some of it illuminating, and some of it stupid. Get your five righties group together to discuss your readings. Try some of the stuff you read about, see what works, see what fails. Identify the things that you can do, plan them out, and do them. You'll fail. You'll fail a lot. You'll feel stupid and ineffective at times, but that's the learning process. Write up after-action reports to document your learnings. If you make a 5 Writings group and feel like letting me know about it, do me a favor and fill out the form at 5 If you're extremely paranoid, you can use a fake name, a new email, or a burner phone if you want. I don't really care. As I said, I'm not a leader. At most, will be an occasional lose letter or something, but this is a way we can trade ideas and notes. The second kind of group we need a bunch of is a centralized group, basically building organizations, a la Lee Staples' recommendations in Roots to Power. The key, again, is to make these localized groups. Local people, local projects, local campaigns, because local power is how you get bigger. You may have some right local groups in your own town already, Look them up and see what's available for you to join. What are some examples of the kinds of groups that you might want to create? Well, we've been seeing a lot of problems on college campuses lately, right? You can organize groups from like-minded people in your alumni network and grow them and use them to put pressure on your university. I'll give you a very specific example of how to build something like that at the end. 
If you live near a campus, you can put a group of people together to offer support and help to student groups so they can put better pressure on their university. There's no reason lefties should be the only ones doing mainstream hardcore activism like disrupting invited speakers. Righties doing it should chant, this is what you do to us, making the playbook aspect explicit, as well as making your demand obvious. You could start a locally focused newspaper or blog. Local news is falling apart everywhere. Good beat reporting is on the down low. What is your city council actually up to? What's the stuff your newspaper isn't printing? How does crime actually work in your town? One potential righty press organization that would be easy to make and scale is something I've called asking for comment. You know how when one Republican in ass and nowhere shits his pants and every Republican in the world is asked for comment? Make that bipartisan. When somebody screws up, get everyone who knows them on the record about it. Note who supports him. Then do a second order call to people who know the supporter, asking their opinions of the supporter's opinion. May people denounce or be tarred. All asking for a comment needs is a website, a contact directory, and a news ar- and a news archive subscription and a telephone. While we're on the subject of publications, don't forget lit drops and lit collection. Donate writey books to your local library, including your local public schools. I'm not talking fire-eating polemics for the faithful, like Ann Coulter's How to Cook and Eat Liberals, but on-ramp books, the things that people get interested in. Stamp the inside of the cover with lists of places to go for more information. Libertarians talk about the importance of charity, but they never stack a copy of The Incredible Bread Machine into their little free library at their local Y. While we're at it, righties need more small publishing companies. A large amount of interesting righty political writing only happens online, which means that it's inevitably lost in time. Blogs go away, links go dead, small-run books on dead trees may be obscure, but they exist forever. Another thing righty small publishers could be doing, homeschooling resources. Homeschooling is an essential righty movement, because at this point, it is an essential everyone movement. You know what parents doing homeschooling could really use? Free and cheap primers. We could use an updated set of McGuffrey readers for the 21st century from an organization that has a good reputation. Paperback, chiefly bound, downloadable, free, or available for purchase cheaply. Put together a local speaking circuit. Get local business owners to go to schools and tell their free enterprise successes and failures stories. A good way to arrange guest lectures in schools is to make friends with teachers. If you have jobs or projects where students can get involved, so much the better. You can organize with your profession. Lefties do this all the time. Ask around. Find people who share your politics. You have professional skills that transfer to political pressure within your workplace and outside it. Look at California, where one of the most militant groups on the ground politically is the Nurses Union. So use them. At this point, it's pretty clear that Augustus Invictus has failed at organizing the Based Lawyers Guild, for which righties should probably be grateful. So righty lawyers, that's on you now. If you're in something like the Federalist Society already, or if you're not, start mining local chapters for people who want to do stuff like be on hand for protest or to counter lefty tactics. Lefties like ambulance-chasing lawyers Let's see how they like lawyers who chased hard lefty radicals and their abettors. If you don't know who in your profession might be on your side, use the same tools lefties use to unperson people. Political donations. Make or obtain a list of companies that do what you do. Note their addresses. Cross-reference them against a list of campaign donations. Focus on people who live in your town. That way, if you put people together, you can get them together for regular meetings. Don't just look for presidential runs in general. If you're putting together a group called Immigration Pause Now, you don't want a Trump general donor who gave to Kasich. And if you're putting together a group called Libertarians Against Tariffs, you wouldn't want to surf old records for a Bush general donor who gave to Buchanan. Political donations aren't a perfect predictor. Not everyone donates. And some righties will have done stuff like donating to Obama as part of ye old Operation Chaos back when Obama was running against Clinton in 2008. 
but that will give you a good list to work from. Once they had the leads, the Bernie Sanders campaign followed an approach to get volunteers for decentralized work. Email 100, if targeted, to 1,000, if randomly selected, people. Invite them to a conference call. Typically, 10 to 50 will sign on. If you give short notice for the conference call, you are more likely to get people who are available on short notice, i.e. respondents who have a lot of free time. On conference call, explain the team's purpose, what they're doing, and the big picture. At the end of the call, give people a task as a shit test to see who's serious. Invite everyone who did the task onto a second conference call. Choose a leader. Give them means to communicate with each other, a mailing list or a Slack channel or something. Sacrifice a goat and pray to Cthulhu. Since you're concentrating on building a local group, invite everyone who did the shit test into step four to an organizational meeting and go from there. I think it would be interesting to combine centralized and decentralized organizing techniques. Organize within your interests, too. Everyone needs art. If you have art interests, start a group of righty artists and musicians. Songs build communities. The DSA is singing the Internationale and Solidarity Forever at their meetings, for Pete's sake. Write some great new righty songs with catchy tunes and rousing choruses. For people who like service to their communities, come up with something that has a service component. Lefty anarchists have been doing this for decades with food, not bombs, where they serve food to homeless people. Sounds modest, but they got organized for stuff like the battle in Seattle doing stuff just like this. Again, organization is practice. If you're interested in something that does food service, the Food Not Bombs book, Hungry for Peace, is extremely detailed and provides step-by-step how-tos of how to start and run a Food Not Bombs-style group, which has been a gateway for massive numbers of lefty activists. There have been over a thousand chapters involving 50,000 people. For more reading on Food Not Bombs, which focuses on unflattering sausage making and the challenges in hurting politically radical cats, See Chris Crass's Towards Collective Liberation, which has a hugely detailed chapter all about Food Not Bombs San Francisco chapter. And of course, you're not limited to these ideas, but there are tons of things you can do. And I can hear the objections, but, but infiltration and entryism and, and look guys, we're talking about normie groups here. You're not doing anything crazy or radical. You're just being normies doing normie politics stuff. So it's not like the hard lefties will care. They've got better things to do. And it's not like you're posting an ad on Craigslist and talking to whatever randos show up. You're picking people you already know. And if you don't have other righties handy, don't just post an ad online and see who answers. Go out and talk to people. You've probably got a couple of punch and pie groups in your neighborhood. Drop by a few meetings, talk with people, and find out who's sick of punch and pie. If you're recruiting folks you encounter in real life, it's much less likely that a random person you happen to meet will also be a lefty spy. It is a lot of work, but it is also doable. Honestly, the hardest thing about this stuff is that righties haven't been trained to understand how activism actually works. Here's a specific example how one person could make an organization and run a pressure campaign. In the wake of the Milo riots, Scott Adams, of Dilbert fame, and lately of Trumpist fame, announced that he would stop contributing financially and in other ways to the University of California, Berkeley, his alma mater. And he did. And that was the end of it. Because despite being a guy who thinks a lot about persuasion, and has spent a lot of writing time lately on the subject of persuasion, Adams missed out on a golden opportunity to persuade the University of California at Berkeley. I think this is understandable. Adam's experience of using persuasion comes from four fields, cartooning, writing, public speaking, and hypnotism. He's a trained hypnotist, did you know? For Adams, persuasion and communication are things he does to reach an audience, which for him, in every case but public speaking, is one person. And it's done by one person, him. So that's what persuasion looks like to him in his head. It's a solo activity. But acting as an individual isn't how you maximize persuasive power against institutions. 
Scott Adams is a rich, successful guy who went to the University of California, Berkeley. Does he know other rich and successful guys who went to the University of California, Berkeley? I bet he does. Are there any of them who disagree with Berkeley's decision to enable violent radicals pushing students and the town around? I bet there are too. Does Berkeley have a convenient alumni directory in hard copy or accessible via web? It does. Here's how Scott Adams maximizes his power in the hypothetical. He makes a list of people he knows personally from Berkeley, people who donate money and time to the university, who know who he knows are unhappy about the Milo riot. Then he calls them on the phone. They talk for a while. He makes it clear he's putting together donors who want to do something to make the university act on this issue, gets their commitment, then goes to the next person on the list. He holds a meeting for his group of well-off UC Berkeley donors, ideally of a variety of ages, so their network consists of different graduating cohorts. They discuss what they're doing, what their demands will be, and then go off and do another round or two of phone calls in their own personal networks. Another meeting or two, formalize demands, make sure everyone signs on, and literally make a written pledge that people sign. While they're doing this, they keep a tally of how much money their members are worth and how much they have donated. Then Scott Adams writes a letter to the president of the University of California, Berkeley. Hi, he says. This is Scott Adams, you know, the Dilbert guy. I'm writing to let you know that I've put together a signed petition from X number of donors with a combined net worth of Y million dollars. In the past five years, our average donation were N dollars per year. Last year's total was Z dollars. For that money, we got to see you let a riot on campus that cost over $100,000 in damage of our money as donors and taxpayers and left innocent people unconscious in the street. We're not going to stand for that. You're used to meeting radicals' demands. Well, you can meet ours. Unless our demands are met, we are prepared to start canceling pledged donations and send our press releases detailing exactly why we're doing it. Here are a few possible demands. A statement from the University of California at Berkeley enforced by policy committing to free speech. A statement by the University of California enforced by policy banning masked protests on pain of arrest. A statement from the University of California enforced by policy the destruction of university property is grounds for expulsion. A statement from Berkeley enforced by policy that all members of Berkeley's violent communist cult, by any means necessary, BAM, and associated groups, do research beforehand and name specific groups and individuals who participated, are trespassing from campus, meaning they will be arrested if they set foot on university property. If the university president waffles at these demands, Adams Group contacts the university trustees and informs them what is happening. They will put secondary pressure on the president. At this point, Adams Group may choose to add the president's resignation to the list of demands they want. He and his people also keep working phones, adding more and more people to the petition, so the number of people and potential financial harm to the university grows. If they still don't agree, Adams Group alerts the press brings in a deadline. If we do not receive a firm commitment by this date, we will cancel $100,000 of pledges, i.e. we can do at least as much damage to you as your radicals did. Would you like us to do more? A few rounds of this should cause some concessions at the university's part. Up the dollar values each time. Adam's group will have decided in advance what victory would look like. That's what a pressure campaign does. That's what a post-politics world looks like. If you don't want to live in one, I agree, but that's too bad. That's what we're getting. So we'll have to go out and build it if we want it on the right.